Evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Moro and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded and distributed, please go to the LinkedIn live video feed, the link to which I've just placed in the chat room. Tonight, our featured guest is Michael Dees, a jazz multi-instrumentalist and professor of jazz at Michigan State University. Michael's latest album, Grove's Groove, will be the subject of tonight's conversation. Welcome, Michael. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Michael, so t tell us uh, about where you come from, uh, how your musical tastes were formed, and why you decided to become a so-called jazz multi-instrumentalist. In other words, you just didn't uh, didn't want to just master one instrument, the trombone. You're also mastering the saxophone. Tell us all about that. Well, that's, that's very kind, but, you know, on the, on the journey of music, I don't think any of us feel like masters. I think we're just doing the best we can, but I, that's very kind of you. Um, I'm originally from Augusta, Georgia. It's the place in Georgia, right on the border of South Carolina on the Savannah River. And it's famous for several things. The Masters Golf Tournament, they call the Augusta National. And it was the childhood home of James Brown. So being from Augusta, Georgia, I got to hear the music of James Brown everywhere growing up at home on the radio, at school. I mean, James Brown is one of our heroes. So uh, I got a dose of the blues and funk and rhythm very early on as a, as a young cat, as a young kid. I'm not a cat. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so growing up at, at that time in the, in the 80s, uh, hearing a lot of the music of my parents, uh, my dad liked uh, blues, uh, doo-wop music, uh, the original rock and roll and rhythm and blues. It was uh, great hearing all those saxophone solos back in the back in the fifties. It, it's uh, really fantastic. And then, and then my mother listened to Motown uh, almost exclusively, so I got to hear all that soul music, and it just seeped into my soul. And uh, as I started playing uh, music in school, started on the recorder when I was in third grade, then switched to saxophone in fifth grade. I started to try to imitate those sounds, the sounds I was hearing on the radio and at home. Uh, I started as a saxophonist, uh, and then when I was 15, after getting the uh, taste for jazz music that I heard all everywhere around me, I switched to trumpet. And then finally at 17, I heard Curtis Fuller on Blue Train, John Coltrane's a seminal album, and switched to trombone, self-taught, uh, Within a year, I had a full scholarship to Florida State University as a jazz trombone major. And then I transferred after a year to the Juilliard School in New York City. So uh, my life has all been formed around uh, listening to the blues, listening to funk music, listening to soul and swing and uh, 
very American uh, sounds. You know, our, our folk music is, is the blues. So as I got older and started playing more and more, I, I decided to reach back into my history and, and bring back the saxophone. And that, that's where the baritone saxophone has made this uh, reintroduction into my life. Okay, let's have a listen to another song. This is Minor Funk. Michael, so tell us uh, about the idea behind this album. It's, uh, I understand, dedicated or uh, imbued with the spirit of Roy Hargrove, who was a mentor to you. Tell us uh, about that. Again, you said how James Brown was such a big influence on your life. Tell us about this new album. Yeah, thanks for asking. The uh, We form uh, fa families uh, around each other in jazz music. It's it's, you know, uh, these great artists uh, become sort of sort of the, the leaders of, 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 of I, you know, I, I don't want to liken it to organized crime, but, but, but it could, it could be something like, you know, the, uh, like the Hargrove family or the Marsalis family or the, uh, or the uh, Coltrane dynasty. Uh, it's it's amazing how uh, the, these beacons of spirituality and music attract like-minded souls, and so you, you have just special people, and I, I think it happens in all fields, and most especially music, uh, that their their power in humanity is so great, it, it takes their artistry to a. a a level that very few get to and, and they draw people around them so for this this album the, the the people that i chose to be on it were all uh very spiritually touched by the presence and the the life and the contributions of roy hargrove in different ways uh, several of the members of the band played with him directly uh, such as terrell stafford steve davis Rodney Whitaker toured with Roy Hargrove for uh, five years and made several records of lifelong friends. And then we have people that um, were inspired by him from a distance, like Bill Cunliffe and Jocelyn Gould. And, and they, they understand the importance of mentorship and giving back to the community. Uh, so they kind of represent the spirit of Roy in their own daily contributions to music. So. You know, we we lost 
Roy a few years ago uh, at, at a very young age. He hadn't quite yet turned 50. And I wanted to uh, create a body of work that not only paid tribute and uh, memorialized him, but, but represented the spirit of creation in playing in the moment uh, and, and, and really showing how the, how the seeds that he planted in people blossomed into, into different musical entities. And so, so it's, it's more of a celebration of what he stood for and uh, all of the gifts that he gave to the community and to us, you know, individually and specifically too. So that was the, the genesis about this album. That's why it's called Grove's Groove. Grove is Hargrove. And Groove is what Roy Hargrove was all about. I mean, he was in, the, in a sense, sort of the ultimate dance jazz musician. I mean, he collaborated with musicians from Cuba, from Japan, uh, certainly Europe, all over the world, South America. He, uh, he uh, had a collaboration with Erica Badu, uh, he had a band called R.H. Factor. He played with strings. He was a bebop um, master musician. He, he sang. So, you know, we're, we miss him so much. So Grove's Groove, actually the title track, is composed by his uh, peer in the music, Steve Davis. And I thought it would be the perfect title for a project like this. And uh, Michael, tell us, we're about to listen to two, T for Two. This was a favorite song of his, or how, why is this included? Yeah, T for Two is one of the two tracks that feature uh, vocalist and guitarist Jocelyn Gould. These these songs were, uh, they are uh, what we call American songbook standards. And they're special to me and to this project because Roy himself taught me these songs at the piano. He had this... Uh, this, this thing that he did to, to so many musicians where he would see somebody that didn't know a particular song and he would go over in person and play the piano and show the person how the chord progression goes and he would sing the melody. So I had this amazing experience one time with Roy Hargrove where he said, uh, where he sang the lyrics and played the piano for me, showing me the root motion, the bass, uh, how he voiced the uh, extensions and the playing the melody and singing. And so T for Two has that, I think about that every time I hear the song. So so we had Jocelyn Gould uh, sing this and, and then we played, you know, accompanying her. Let's have a listen. Picture me upon your knee just he for two and two for tea Just me for you and you for me alone Nobody near us to see us or hear us No friends or relations or weekend vacations We won't have it known, dear We own a telephone, dear Day break and I'll awake and start to bake a sugar cake for you to take for all the boys to see we could raise a family a boy for you a girl for me can't you see how happy we would be Michael, so tell us a little bit before we get into our uh, deeper part of the conversation. Tell us more about these musicians, what you look for in a musician. I understand, as we, I said at the beginning, you're also a professor of music. You're passing on these uh, special uh, traits and values to other students. What's important for you when uh, you're working with a musician? What do you look for in a musician? That's a great question. It's, it's really Wonderful, because a lot of our students ask that question too. They they want to know while they're young, you know, how to work on getting the skill sets together and uh, and marketing themselves as musicians that really want to play and, and be out there as much as possible. The things I look for are are um, 
you know, in, in when I first started out, it was it was tied to the musical traits, you know, playing in tune, uh, having a good feeling, a good rhythmic feeling, having a, having a great sound. To me, the first thing that you hear with somebody after after you see them, of course, is is their sound. Like, how do they sound? Does that sound grab you? Does it affect you? Is it varied? Does it does it carry dynamics with it? Is there an energy imbued in, inside of the sound? So um, cer certainly for this this record and, and a lot of the, all the projects that I do, you know, having a great sound on your instrument is very very important. And and uh, but once we get past the musical bona fides, it's important uh, for, for me, for my collaborators, and and for myself most certainly to to be in touch with the humanity uh, behind why we chose to be musicians and why we're playing particular songs. Uh, when, when you can understand the relationship between uh, the, the why behind someone's art, then, then you, you grapple it and you tackle it and you interpret it and you play it differently. It's, it's, it's in a, a, another way to say it would, would be just having respect for the origins of someone's musical tastes so that's, that's something I, I deal with uh, a lot as a uh, trombonist and, and a saxophonist, but, but more as a trombonist uh, where I have to play vastly different styles from day to day. You know, I might have to play uh, New Orleans jazz uh, one, one day, which has a completely different set of ingredients and characteristics and stylistic choices that you would make, say, as opposed to my, my six-year tenure with Davis Sanborn, where I... I did very, very little uh, New Orleans inspired playing. Uh, where, where I might have to play bebop with the Dizzy Gillespie All-Stars, or I might have to play something, uh, you know, really down home and dirty with the Christian McBride big band. So so all these musicians that we, that I, that I picked here, like Terrell Stafford has a gorgeous sound, plays in all these different styles. He has so many influences. Steve Davis is one of my favorite trombonists. My, might be, uh, he's up there in my, my top five of all time great uh, jazz trombone players. Uh, Jocelyn Gould brings such a special, uh, she has so much joy in her playing that I, I find it infectious. And it makes me like seeing her humanity and, and how much she's enjoying the moment of creating and, and respecting that, that uh, charge of being an artist. It makes me play better, it makes me feel more excited about uh, creating a conversation and a dialogue on stage. So that's that's some of the things I look for, some of the things I tell students, um, have fun. Like remember, this, the, the whole point of studying music in school is following, following and chasing your dreams. So you can't look at this as a, uh, you know, as, as learning music as, a, as homework or a, or a sentence of, of some sort you have to look at it as an opportunity to to do the thing that you love most in the world michael and uh we're going to get into this in a second uh but um before we listen to our next song tell us uh so you grew up in a, this uh very rich musical culture and you had your parents uh, really imbuing all this musical culture in different ways with you some a student who shows up at michigan state university who uh, doesn't come from that culture or whatever, can it be taught? Yeah, it can be taught in, in the sense that you can model it. Uh, what we do, uh, in, as a matter of fact, the, one of the reasons I love Michigan State so much is that the, the jazz faculty, um, we don't just teach the techniques, we model them and we live them. So we have a certain amount of performances that we're able to do while still being a professor. Uh, we, we all take the initiative to record. We hire our students and take them out on, on uh, live gigs and show them the ropes while we're actually doing the, doing the projects together. Um, so I, I, I do think it can be taught and, and it, it's a two way street. It, I think we have to, a, a lot of times I'll tell students that we have to meet in the middle, right? Like we have, your, your teacher, your professor with, you know, XYZ experience. And then you have 
students, which come in at all different levels. You know, I had one student from uh, Houston that grew up in a jazz culture. So he's, he's already knows a lot of names to listen to. He, he, he has a hat collection, you know, he, it's all, all types of them. I'm, I'm kidding, but he has all types of things already bubbling and percolating in his, in his uh, vision. And then I, I, I'll have a student from, you know, a high school in a cornfield, <laughs> you know, and, there, and there's no jazz and there's no radios around and no one knows who to listen to. Uh, there's no jazz radio station. Yeah, but, but that student <clears throat> recognizes how special the music is and, and they're, they're ignited by that spark of, of creation that's always present in great jazz. So we, we, we teach it, we talk about it, we model it, we watch videos, we, um, we answer questions, we, we all share, you know, the, the students also teach each other. That's something that, that is uh, really special. I learned as much from my, my peers at Juilliard and Florida State. Um, and then I learn a lot from my students as well, too. You know, they'll, they'll hit me to new records to check out. So it's just this big 360 degree head on a swivel, you know, awareness of, of where your next musical lesson is going to come from. So it, it can definitely be taught. Quite exciting. Let's have a listen now to Broadway. This brings us to our uh, more philosophical part of the conversation that I know everyone looks forward to every week, Michael. And this is picking up uh, on where we left off a music student from a cornfield, uh, from a high school in a cornfield with no radio. On October 29th, 1792, Beethoven's patron, Count Waldstein, encapsulated why he was sending the young musician to Vienna, writing, and this is my translation from the original German to English, quote, Dear Beethoven, your dream has been dashed so many times, but finally you are on your way to Vienna. Mozart's genius is still weeping over the death of her protege. His genius has sought temporary refuge in Haydn, but has no plans to set up a new workshop in him. She is still looking for the right person in which to sh set up shop. Through uninterrupted woodshedding, she will come to reside in you. In other words, you will be anointed with Mozart's spirit through Haydn's hands. End quote. Just a few hundred years later, Michael, in February 2024, jazz journalist Sean Brady writes, quote, Michael Dees met Roy Hargrove while playing together in the Jimmy Heath Big Band and the Dizzy Gillespie All-Star Big Band. Dees already revered the trumpeter, a generation older. Meeting him and eventually working with him became an entry point into a musical world that had previously seemed out of reach. Quote, Roy was one of my first intersections with living jazz. D's Marvels. I had been inspired by Charlie Parker and Duke Ellington and the Count Basie band, but those seemed like mythological figures. Roy represented the actual living context of which being a jazz musician is all about. He played in every corner of the music. He was uplifting and powerful and energetic. And then he was romantic and was experimental and traditional and historical. That became a beacon for what I value in music. It 
was a model for how I want to try to carry the tradition forward while continuing to search and seek in a progressive way, end quote. Michael, you're joining us from New York City, where the U.S. Open will soon take place. How many of its competitors are excited about the trip because they are seeking Arthur Ashe's spirit or are even aware that Arthur Ashe played tennis? With that in mind, why does Michael Deese and why does Count Waldstein revere tradition so much? Wow, that was beautiful. I, that was great. That um, I, I like your translation. And uh, it's, I got to get over being compared to uh, Mozart and Haydn here. Um, the uh, I, I I think I understand what what you're what you're saying. In, in my um, like being here in, in New York City in the spirit of Arthur Ashe and and certainly the the the, the the tennis court there is that named the Arthur Ashe Stadium, you know, I think the, the, that, that it's kind of a simple answer. And I think that the, we revere and respect the tradition so much because that is why that answers the why question, you know, what, what, what we're doing did not come out of a vacuum. It didn't, appear out of a black hole one day and then we started right here in the uh the the, the beginning of 2024 playing uh, modern progressive experimental jazz music there's a there's a reason why we're here where we are doing what we're doing and that the why exists be behind the present moment right it has to because we don't we haven't developed you know a space uh, time travel yet uh, you know you know we don't have any you know at least not not to my knowledge you know the aliens haven't told us anything yet so um, but but it's, it's it's simple like the you know we're here because our parents you know that's that's why we're here um, our parents in the music or our uh, ancestors they're, they're the, the people that created the styles that we love, They're, they innovated how to play our instruments uh, at, at more and more expressive and beautiful levels. They created a list of repertoire of beautiful compositions that uh, inspire and challenge and, and make us laugh and cry. Uh, it's intrinsically tied to the history of the world. And I mean, not just culturally, but regionally. Um, uh, it, it's tied to the law of the land. You know, the music, jazz music was created at a time when uh, a very complicated time, uh, post-Civil War in the United States, where, where uh, there was a, a small period uh, of, of newfound sense of, uh, you know, equality. Uh, which, which I had to put in uh, quotes, air quotes here, because be, be, because things things did seem very promising for Black Americans. Uh, you know, starting to serve in Congress, uh, getting to travel freely, uh, more freely than they ever have before. But then we dealt with Plessy v. Ferguson. Then we dealt with uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, m music that was created by. Uh, gathering of different people in Congo Square, all different levels of musicians and backgrounds, now all of a sudden gets completely separated along racial lines. So you have all this tied together in the creation and dissemination and the development of jazz music. That's why, that's just the simple question, it's why. So, so being, being aware of that history, uh, loving it and learning from it, uh, and, and, and continuing to deal with it as you progress and live in today's world is it, it makes you so to me so wholesome and and so informed and that information is only going to make you soar higher and higher as you try to make sense of the world around you. I imagine Roy Hargrove uh, is very happy uh, to hear you say that or would be very happy to hear you say that. Let's um Let's uh, listen to The Viper now.
Michael, last question. What do you wish those who listen to this album? Yeah, thanks for that. The, uh, uh, a lot of things actually, but, but, you know, I, I, I want people to be comfortable when they listen to music and I want, uh, that's maybe my first thing is I want people to have a good time and, and I want them to feel like the, the balance of like singing and relaxation and, and groove and pocket and, and, and comfort that they, that they feel and excitement. Uh, that's, that's elements of music that are very important to me. It's, it's what made me fall in love with jazz music is being able to move, being able to sing, being able to hear the blues, uh, being inspired, being challenged and, and being comforted and soothed by the music. So that's, that's, that's one big thing. Um, I would, I would wish that people that are interested in the tunes would check out the artists, the other artists in the band. So everybody on the roster of musicians is a star in their own right. They all lead projects. Ulysses Owens has a downbeat award-winning big band. Uh, Steve Davis played with the Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers and the late Chick, Chick Corea. Uh, Terrell Stafford is a is a, on the jazz cruise this year with uh, Christian McBride and um, Bill Cunliffe is an, a Grammy Award winning arranger. So, you know, I would I would love for people to learn more about the musicians on this project. Um, I'd like people to be able to hum the songs and sing along with them if they like them, you know, that's like, take the music with you. Um, I think that's one of the biggest, it's, it's kind of like the, you know, compliments to the chef is if, if there can be a type of earworm or something that sticks with you. And, um, and then too, to check out the, the composers of the songs, you know, one, one thing that I, uh, I, I try to stand for is I, I, I try to, to uh, record compositions by other uh, great jazz artists that may have been overlooked. Uh, you know, we record the music in, <clears throat> of Thelonious Monk, uh, Wayne Shorter, Duke Ellington, uh, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker. Uh, the, these songs are recorded by nearly every jazz artist that came after them. But for instance, The Viper is recorded by Charles McPherson. You know, I think it's only been recorded once. This will be the second version of the of uh, the Viper ever. And Charles McPherson is in his 80s, uh, legendary jazz artist. So, so I think anything we can do to to uh, you know show honor and love and light to the people in our community is is important. So those are just, that's just a few things. So let's see how we can stay in touch with Michael. Um, here we have. His website, michaeldeese.com. That is D E A S E, michaeldeese.com. And Michael, people can buy the album through here. Is that right? Yes, they will. They will, because the person that does my website will be putting the link there to buy the new album. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so buy the buy the new album here. It's out now uh, on michaeldeese.com. And then, uh, Michael, people can also follow you about your concerts, find out um, what you're up to. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, the best way to, to do that is to follow me on Instagram, uh, uh, reach out to me on Facebook. Um, uh, I have a whole list of things that you can check out there for resources, links, uh, videos, transcriptions. Uh, and that's a great way to reach out to me uh, directly. I've had people reach out with questions or uh, projects they're working on in, in either for advice or to collaborate for something. I'm very easy and, and uh, very friendly to uh, work with and, and reach out to. So thanks for that. Yep. So, so feel free to reach out to Michael there at michaeldees.com or on Instagram at Facebook. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so very much to Professor Michael Deese. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Wonderful let's, time. Let's see what's coming up next week on Vienna Live. It is Imaginario 
interlude of the Duende, Los Angeles, the world world traversed in genre fluid guitarist Ethan Margolis, aka Imaginario, is a prime example of an artist who has become greater than the sum of his many parts and pathways. Through the eclectic filter of his musical passions, studies, and influences, Margolis has evolved into a creative and worldly artist whose deep connections with Romani people, flamenco, jazz, blues, and even punk coalesce into a unique musical voice. Elements of that Margolis style can be heard coming to fruition on his forthcoming album, Interlude of the Duende, in trio form with bassist Larry Grenadier and drummer Eric Hartland, set for July 19 release on Ropa Dope. Come welcome Imaginario to our show. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simiamore.com. And uh, while you're at it, I uh, may I suggest you sign up for the Friday greeting by putting in your, uh, registering your email at, again, that's simiamore.com. So next week, Imaginario, interlude of the Duende. Again, thank you so very much to Professor Michael Deese. Thank you to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan and Agnieszka and Benoit Rivolet for their support of this show. Thanks to my cousin Mike, a marketer from Layer App. If you're an architect or an engineer, they have a really cool tool you should check out. Thanks also to Mary Schlesinger for the lovely Viennese Library you can see behind me. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From New London, New Hampshire, and New York City, goodbye, and see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye.